Ah, my lords and ladies, dear patrons, I am Lord Blooddraw, and you have come home to the Cathode Zone, where each week we will explore the shadowy depths of old-time TV. <laughs> One of the oldest prejudices on Earth is that what is beautiful must also be good, and what is ugly must also be evil. I know, I learned that from Star Trek. But if an ugly, evil man was suddenly made handsome, would he no longer be evil? That's the central question in this tale that comes to us from the dim, distant year of 1951. From Lights Out comes the tale, The Faceless Man. <laughs> this episode stars Robert Sterling, who starred in the original 1961 film, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, as Captain Crane, and a few years before that in 1953, scored a television hit starring as the ghost with the most, George Kirby, in the popular TV show Topper. <laughs> well, let's hand it over to our uncomfortably close, creepy announcer as we get into part one of our story, The Faceless Man, from Lights Out. Have you ever longed to have a different face, another name, a new life? Well, if you have, remember there are some things you can never leave behind. Lights out! Mr. Carvel. They told me Dr. Peter Cranford was the finest plastic surgeon in all of London. I trust your reputation will reflect itself in the finished work. Turn around, please. I suppose you were puzzled by my request for absolute secrecy, Doctor. Oh, great many of my disfigured patients have a sense of shame about themselves, Mr. Carvel. Society makes certain of that. Strange, your parents made no effort to... I had no parents. I'm what you might call a self-made man. What wealth I have, I fought for. I detest ugliness, Doctor. Yet you wore it like an emblem all these years. I had no money until recently. Hold still, please. Now, oh, just one moment. Mr. Carvel, behold. There are no scars, just two fine lines near the lobes, where the skin graft was clipped back. You have the original photographs, Doctor? Yes. May I see them, please? Uh, certainly. I shall want this destroyed. I am afraid that's impossible. You see, I always keep a duplicate set of photos. It gives me a record of my work. And on rare occasions, the police require them. I insist it be destroyed. I wore that face like a mask of horror for 30 years. I want no reminders. Mr. Carvel, we had an agreement when you came here. I asked you no questions. You paid me the sum of $15,000 and I performed cosmetic surgery. 
You haven't been particularly pleasant to work with. I've often suspected you could use a little good psychotherapy along with the physical treatment. Now, I must insist on my rights as a physician. This photograph is part of my record. You don't understand, do you, Doctor? Very well, let me tell you. I was in France a few months before I came here. There was a girl. A very beautiful girl. I mistook her kindness for affection. And when she told her lover, he laughed at me. He laughed at me. The shame was his. No, it was mine. It was then I swore to destroy every ugly thing I found in my path. Including my own ugliness, Doctor. Now, I want that photograph. Mr. Carvel, I don't believe your motives are as simple as you say. Who are you? Where are you from? Why did you insist on such absolute secrecy? Your name is not listed in the directory. Now, what is it? Are you wanted for some crime? Perhaps I can help you if you trust me. I want that photograph, Doctor. I'm sorry, Mr. Carvel. Yes. Well, you won't... you won't find him in here. He's away for a weekend. I had hoped to be here in time. You're too late. Do I know you? Do I know you? This way, monsieur. Welcome to the house of the silent man. I, Etienne Dubois, assure you of every hospitality. You will find, monsieur, that... Uh, uh, pardon, un moment, s'il vous plaît, pardon. Hello? Hello? Thank you. On convive. My daughter, Hello, on convive anglais. Bonjour, monsieur. So, I will bring this up. What do you know, monsieur? Crane. Franklin Crane. How do you spell this? Let me. You have been here before, Monsieur Crane. You recognize my face? No, and yet something. Perhaps the voice is like one I have known. Oh, yes. An evil man. Well, look at my face. Do I look evil? Au contraire, Monsieur. I am rather handsome. Oui, monsieur. Good. We shall be friends. The south room, monsieur. Comes. I shall want a north room. Oh, but monsieur... You haven't one available? Oh, we have one, and it is available, but it looks over the cliff facing the I'll ocean. I'll take it. Oui, monsieur. Papa? Oui? Monsieur Crane wanting north room. Oui, mon petit. Monsieur? You're very lovely. Merci, monsieur. Are you married? No, monsieur. Engaged? No. Strange. Such a beautiful girl as you. My fiancé was killed, monsieur. I'm sorry. Bien, bien. C'est fini. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've traveled a long way. Monsieur? Uh, never mind. Uh, I'll find my way. Oui, monsieur. 
Good night, monsieur. Bonsoir. Mademoiselle. You're very attractive men. There's something about him. Oh, you imagine. Papa, he asked me if I were married. So? Well, one day, you will try to forget about René and think about somebody else. Good evening. Who are you? What are you doing here? Let us say for the moment that I am your traveling companion. You followed me from London? Much further than that. What do you want? I came to be with you. Why? You see, Mr. Carvel, I am too ugly to face the world. You must know how that feels. You were a patient of Dr. Cranford. I was. Did he... Change you? No, he might have, but you destroyed all hope when you plunged the scalpel in his back. So you know? I know a good many things. What makes you think you leave this room alive? Only my knowledge of you. You are cool, aren't you? I suppose you intend to blackmail me. You have it all down in writing somewhere, haven't you? And if you're destroyed, the letter will be mailed to the police, is that I it? I knew I could trust your disfigured mind to do something like that. And what do you want? What are you doing here? I've already told you, Mr. Carvel, I came to be with you. Being ashamed of myself, I prefer to hide from the world. Naturally, I must eat and have companionship. I think it is poetic justice that you nourish and protect me. Take off that mask. Don't do it, Mr. Carvel. I warn you. Don't remove the mask. You won't like what you see. Look, I'll give you money. You can go wherever you want to go. I have you no go place to... to go. How long? How... How long do you intend to stay here? How long? Forever, Mr. Carvel. Forever. <laughs> Forever is an awfully long time, especially to put up with an unwanted intruder like the faceless man. But, after all, he did kill the doctor that could have fixed his face, so... fair exchange? Carville has gone to a lot of trouble and expense to return to France and take up with the innkeeper's lovely daughter, only to see it jeopardized by this invisible man cosplayer. What do you think Carville's true intentions are with the girl? Did the doctor's scalpel cut away a lifetime of pain and rage? Does he love her? Can he? Let's find out as we go on to part two of The Faceless Man from Lights Out. He has not come down yet? Not yet, Papa. Strange man, that one. Always he likes to keep to himself. Even cleans his own room. Yesterday, I heard him talking to himself. I heard what I thought was another voice in conversation with Monsieur Crane. I made an excuse to enter, but there was no one with him. He seems very nice, Papa. So, uh, he finds you attractive? Oui, Papa. And you, how do you find him? He's a very handsome man, but... When I think of René... But René is dead. He's coming. Ah, bonjour, Etienne. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour, Laura. Bonjour, monsieur Crane. You look quite lovely this morning. Merci, monsieur. You have a most attractive daughter, Etienne. Ah, oui, oui, monsieur. 
I have a necklace in my room. It belonged to my mother. With your permission, I'd like to make a present to your daughter. If monsieur's intentions are those of a serious man... Oh, I assure you, Etienne, they are. Most serious. Most serious. with yourself this morning. I am, I am. I take it the romance is going rather well. You know too much for your own good. This is more than mere romance, though. What makes you think so? She rejected you once. How did you know that? You forget, Mr. Carvel, I too am ugly. And so you swore to have your revenge. You would make her love you, marry you, and then torture her for the rest of her life. Who are you? Who are you? I might be many people, Mr. Carvel. I might be a twisted figment of your own imagination. Or I might even be the spirit of René Philippe. What do you know of that? Nothing, Mr. Carvel. Nothing. <laughs> to us, Francis Carvel, the inseparable devoted companions. <laughs> You like working here, Laura? It's agreeable. Papa is very nice. Why well, should think a beautiful girl like you would be more at home in, say, Paris? Wearing beautiful gowns, eating at the best places? Monsieur makes a joke. No, I'm most serious. If you were my wife, you'd have nothing but the best. She was very flattering. Laura. I'd like you to accept a small gift. Oh, I'm afraid I could Please, not. I, I've already spoken with your father. But, Monsieur Carvel... Laura! Don't shut me out. I've fallen in love with you. I want you to marry me. Oh, I realize this is very sudden. Well, you see, I haven't very much more time. I have to go back to England in a week. And I would be very proud if you would join me. I do not know what to say, Monsieur... Don't say anything now. Think it over. And please accept this necklace my mother wore. You see? <coughs> uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir, Etienne. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to my room. But, Monsieur Crane. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Monsieur Crane gave me a gift, Papa. Well. He wants to marry me, Papa. And you? I don't know. He's very nice. But always, but he is handsome. He has money, he's respectable. Uh, let us see the gift. Mon Dieu! This is a very bad joke. This is no joke, Papa. The cord. It is the cord which strangled René. Oh, you are mad. I know it is, Papa. And I know what frightened me about Monsieur Crane. Oh, you speak nonsense. Papa, it is he. I swear it is he. He? Who? Monsieur Crane is the ugly one. You cannot mean Carvel. Yes. But this one is handsome, a gentleman. The other was a beast. Papa, it is he. I know it is he. The voice, even the initials FC are the same. I cannot believe it. Wait here. We will see about this. Papa, be careful. You gave her the necklace? Yes. Does she know you murdered for it? She knows nothing. She's going to marry me. So I can't have you around anymore. You're going to murder her soul. I don't know who you are. I don't even know whether you exist to anyone except to me. But if you're not out of here by tonight, I'm going to kill you. Do you really think you can destroy me? I'm not afraid of you anymore. I warn you, Carvel. Take off that mask. Quick. Get behind the drapes.
Yes, what is it? I will speak with you, Monsieur Crane. Well, I... I was just about to turn in. Perhaps later we can talk. No, Monsieur. Very well. What is it about? This. I never saw it. You presented it to my daughter this evening. I? I saw her open the box with my own eyes. But why should I give her... Her lover was found with a rope such as this wrapped about his throat, monsieur. Look, I assure you I had nothing to do with this. I gave her a necklace I... There has been some mistake. I must apologize, of course. Perhaps the police would be interested in this Believe matter. me, A.T., and I know nothing about this. This is some ghastly joke. Joke? Look, give me some time. I need some time to figure out how this ghastly thing happened. You did it. Oh, did you do it yourself? You can't confuse me anymore. Perhaps it was you. Perhaps instead of placing the necklace in the case, you accidentally enclosed the cord. The same cord, Mr. Carvel, that you strangled René Philippe. You know everything, don't you? I know everything you know. I know that one evening a year ago, René Philippe sat in this room and laughed at you when you told him you loved Lord Dubois. I know you were very angry and ashamed of your ugliness. You tore a length of cord from the curtain at that window. And that very same night, René Philippe's body was found on the rocks below with a cord around his throat. <laughs> <laughs> I warn you, Carvel. <laughs> You have my face. My whole face. You dead. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? No. It can't be. I'm going out of my mind. I just killed you. I felt your body. You were dead. Get away. Get away. Do you not recognize your own ugliness, Francis Carvel? Do you not see in me the monster you tried to destroy within yourself? Francis Carvel, I am the horror in your own black soul. Fallen from the window. Is he dead, Baba? We. Oui. What a pity. Such a handsome man. <gasps> what is it, Baba? No, no. Do not look. Go quickly, fetch the police. What Go. Is it? Go quickly. NBC Television. Well, there's $15,000 down the drain. You spend that kind of money, you'd think the plastic surgery would last longer than that. You know, he ought to demand his money back. Oh, no, wait. Um, he can't. He killed the doctor. And he's dead, too, so, oh well. Live and learn, or die and learn, I guess. <laughs> The Lights Out TV series was based on the long-running Lights Out radio show, which ran from 1934 to 1947. 
The radio show was created by writer Willis Cooper, who had the idea of a mystery series to run at midnight, when most other radio stations were running music or just signing off. The idea proved very popular, and, capitalizing on that popularity, Mr. Cooper left the show in 1936 and went to Hollywood to become a screenwriter. In 1939, he wrote the screenplay for the third installment in the Universal Frankenstein series, Son of Frankenstein, creating the character that some consider to be Bela Lugosi's best and most unique role, Igor, the crooked-necked grave robber who survived the hangman's noose. <laughs> well... I hope you'll join me again here next week, dear patrons, as we tour the dark depths of what TV used to be. <laughs> as always, I am Lord Bloodraw saying, you're always at home in the cathode zone. <laughs>